Let's turn to Psalm 34. I'm just going to preach from a few verses, but I want to read the whole psalm. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord, and He heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto Him, and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. But they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life, and loveth many days, that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil, and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil, and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and His ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in Him shall be desolate. Father, we thank You for free salvation. We thank You that You chose to save some sinners out of this mass of polluted, ruined mankind. Lord, we pray that you would once again convince us in our hearts to trust you and give us grace, Lord, to actually do it and to pursue you and your righteousness and leave off pursuing these vain things that or of no value. Lord, we do have many afflictions and many troubles, and we're so incapable of saving ourselves or doing anything to help our suffering brethren. But we trust your word, and we know by experience and by your faithfulness that it's true, that you do deliver the righteous out of all our affliction and all our troubles. 
Everything you've done, you've done to make us the righteous. You delivered us even in that, making us righteous. And everything else that is a trouble to us, Lord, you deliver us. We pray for Ravi and Debbie, Chloe, and their whole family. And we pray, Lord, for Brother Darvin and Kathy. Pray for that whole church family. We pray for Sister Winna. Pray, Lord, you'd give her strength and keep her and Keep her looking to Christ and give her the strength to, to get through day by day. We pray for the church down there in Mexico and Brother Walter and Sister Betty. Lord, we pray for our brother Eric Richards. We pray, Lord, you keep him and his family. Lord, your people everywhere that are suffering and in trials and afflictions, ones that we don't know about, ones that we can't call by name, we know you know them. We trust, Lord, you'll keep them and that you'll keep them safe and not let one perish and camp round about them. And we pray for our brethren here, Lord, that might be suffering that we don't know about. And we pray that you continue to keep them as well. Help us now to worship you. Help us to leave this world for a moment. Settle our hearts and our minds. Keep us looking to your word and listening to the message and hearing you speak. Help us forget time just for a little while. Be with your preachers everywhere as they endeavor to preach. Be with Brother Eric and Michelle and the church in Missouri. We pray you're in that work, Lord. We pray that if you're in it, You'll make it known, and if not, you'll make it known. Either way, we trust you give us grace to bow to your will and that you'll bring honor and glory to your name in it. Lord, now help us again, we ask, to worship. Forgive us our sins and our doubting and our wandering minds. We ask all these things and in the name of your dear Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, brethren, let's go back now to Psalm 34. <clears throat> now these are the words written by David. When God delivered him from the hand of his enemies to the cave Adullam. And the psalm is declaring what David taught his brethren when they came to him in that cave. They all gathered there. They were not ashamed to, to own David to be their king. They were not ashamed to, for people to know that Saul was not their king. They were not with the followers of Saul. They were not ashamed they actually went forth to David and David taught them the words of this song, glorifying the Lord, teaching them all concerning what the Lord had done for him. But as with all the Psalms, when we read the Psalms, we look to Christ. And these are the words of Christ to his people. Now that Christ is risen, he's been delivered from all his enemies to the right hand of the Father. And when God brings his people to Christ, Makes us not ashamed to confess Him before men. Not ashamed for men to know that we belong to the Lord. We're looking to the Lord. We trust Him alone. 
We go to Christ, and these are the words Christ teaches us, His people. And what Christ is teaching His brethren here is to look to the Lord. Now, in the first time we looked at this, the first four verses, we saw Christ teaches to glory only in Jehovah. Only in God. Only time a man will stop glorying in himself and start glorying only in the Lord, praising only the Lord for everything concerning his salvation is when Christ, our prophet, has a preach, officially, I mean, uh, effectually taught him in his heart. That's when he'll start praising and glorifying only God. Now this time in verses 4 through 8, we're going to see Christ teach us to look to him. I'm sorry, verses 5 through 8. We're going to see Christ teach us to look to Him. Now, He begins here by showing what God did for our brethren in the past who looked to the Lord. He's teaching us first what all those that looked to the Lord in the past, He's showing us what God did for them. Verse 4, I mean verse 5, They, the humbled, look unto Him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. And then he tells us about himself. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. So he begins by showing us some witnesses, showing us brethren from the past and what the Lord did for them. And then he declares the main point of his message. This is the main point that he's declaring here. Verse 7, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. And then lastly, he gives the most important exhortation that you and I will ever hear in our life. This is the most important word that we're told to do, that, that more important than any other word we'll ever hear. Verse 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Now, the point that he's teaching us here is that all who look to the triune God, trusting and believing on Christ, shall be saved. We look to the triune God by looking to and believing on Christ. In Christ, Christ is the fullness of the Godhead in a body. And the only way we can believe God and, and worship God and trust God is by worshiping and believing and trusting Christ. And all who trust Christ shall be saved. Now, the Lord Jesus is the prophet, priest, and king of his people. He's the one who teaches us through the Spirit, just like he's doing in this psalm right here. He's the prophet, priest, and king of his people. And Christ's message to his people has always been the same. Salvation is of the Lord. Beginning to end and all points in between, salvation is of the Lord. Christ's message when He walked this earth is His message from God's right hand right now. That message is this, I am the door. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Now you and I who already believe, we might think, well, I don't need to hear this. I've heard this and I've heard this repeatedly and I don't need to hear this, this same thing. This is elementary. This is the basics. I don't need to hear this over and over again. If we think that, we're sadly mistaken. Faithful preaching is not preaching something new. Faithful preaching is putting God's people in remembrance of what they already know. That's faithful preaching. Paul told Timothy, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. If you put them in remembrance. Peter said, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. And Paul said, To write the same things to you, to me is not indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. So, we don't need to be taught new things. We need to be put in remembrance of the things we've already been taught. And that's what faithful preaching is. So once again, I'm here to put you in remembrance of what you already know. All 
who cast all their care on Christ. Not just in the first hour. Not just, well, I did that 15 years ago and, you know, now I moved on. All the time, every day, from the first hour to the last, those who cast all their care on Christ, trusting Him to save us, shall be saved. Shall be saved. Now first, our Lord declares this to us by showing us some faithful witnesses of the past. You know, it helps us to, it helps us to know, it encourages us to do something when you see others that have done it and have been successful doing it. That helps you and encourages you that it's the thing to do. Well, Christ Jesus, our prophet, priest, and king, gives us, first of all, the example of humble believers from the past that cast their care on the Lord. He said back up there in verse 2 at the end, he said, the humble shall hear and be glad. And that's what he's talking about here. He's speaking of the humble, and he says in verse 5, they looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. They looked. They looked unto Him. Christ showed us on, on Sunday that salvation, eternal life, is in a look. We saw that those that were bitten by serpents and God told Moses, make that brazen serpent, put it up on a pole, and all that looked to that brazen serpent would be saved. And Christ said that brazen serpent was a type of Him. The Son of Man must be lifted up that whosoever looketh upon him shall have eternal life. Salvation, eternal life, is in a look. Now that means it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. No sinner can save himself by any works of righteousness that we have done. It's not by sorrowing over our sin. Some people seem to act like they think that the, the more they sorrow over their sin... That means they're more, the more repentant they are and the more faithful they are and the more it shows they're dependent on Christ. It's, it's, that won't save us. Augustus Top Lady wrote, Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal, my works, could my zeal no longer know? Would I never get tired? These for sin could not atone. Christ must save and Christ alone. So he said, in my hand, no price I bring. Simply to Christ I cling. I just come to Him with nothing. But the point our Savior's making here is, is that we must actually look to Him. We must actually cast all our care on Him. The Lord says, Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Look unto me. Hebrews 12, 1. Go there with me just a moment. We're talking about faithful witnesses. When you're home, you read Hebrews 11 and see all this cloud of witnesses and all these past brethren who trusted entirely in the Lord and see how the Lord delivered them. These are all witnesses given to us to encourage us in the faith. Look what he says here. Verse Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us actually lay aside every weight. Not just talk about it, not just hear about it. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us actually put one foot in front of the other. Let us actually run with patience the race that God has set before us. And let us actually look. Let us run this looking. That word I-N-G means always, constantly looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross. He despised the shame and He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He's saying let us actually do it. Let us actually look to Christ. Let us truly cast all our care on Him. And then it says back in Psalm 34, when these believers from the past, when they looked to the Lord, they were lightened. 
Verse 5 says they were lightened. It means they were given the light of life. And the margin says they flowed together. Or it, that means they were made one with Christ. And their faces were not ashamed. What is that telling? All who look to Christ the light are enlightened by Christ the light. When you look to Christ the light, you're enlightened by Christ the light. Psalm 18, 28 says, Thou wilt light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. If we look to ourselves, all we are is darkness. Isaiah, in Isaiah, the Lord spoke of men who kindle sparks. They kindle their own sparks and they try to walk in the light they've kindled. When God truly works grace in the heart, and that's how we're truly made to look. When He works grace in the heart, and He makes His child to look, the light that gave us the, the light to even look came from Christ the light. And when He gives you the light to look to Christ, your face is going to be enlightened by Him. You're going to get all your light from Him. And He's going to light up your darkness. He's going to make the Make, the, make you see. And when that margin says they flowed together, it means they're made one with Christ. They flow together with Christ. Like the, you take the vine and the branch and the sap is flowing out of that vine into the branch. And that's how the branch has its life. Light represents life in the Scripture. And to flow together, when you look to Christ, effectually, truly, by the grace of God, you're made one with Christ. And you get your life and your light from Christ. Psalm 36, 9 says, With thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. The life is from Christ, and it's in His light that we see light. It's, it's the same illustration as a vine and the branches. You take the vine and the branches. Christ said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Where does the branches get their life from? Where's the fountain of life for a branch? It's from the vine. That's what he's saying to us. With thee is the fountain of life. When you look to Christ, God has made you one with Christ so that the light that you have now it's coming from Him. It's not coming from ourselves. It's coming from Him. And the fountain of life is from Christ. And it's in, in thy light shall we see light. And therefore their faces were not ashamed. They actually trusted the Lord. They looked to Him. They cast all the care on Him. And they were enlightened by Him. They had life by Him. And so they were not ashamed of Him. They were not ashamed of Him. They weren't ashamed before men to confess that He was all, all their all. They weren't ashamed for trusting Him, for actually trusting Him. Look at uh, Romans 10 with me just a second. Romans 10. I want to put all this together, but Romans 10... And look here. Verse 10. With the heart man believeth. Romans 10, 10. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That's, that's what he's talking about looking unto him. It's, it's believing on him with the heart. With that new heart God's given. He gives you light in the new heart. And you find yourself looking, casting all your care on Christ, believing on Christ from your heart. And you believe unto righteousness. The light that shines back and lightens your face is God makes you to know you've been made the righteousness of Christ. You've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. This has to do with because He's light, and when God makes you look to, light, look to Him, and, and He lightens your face, He makes you one with Him. And He makes you see that you've been made righteousness in Him by what He's done. Then you're not ashamed of Him anymore. And now, you'll confess Him before men. 
you confess him before men. Now that confession, he says, and with the mouth confessions made unto salvation, for the scripture says, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now when he speaks of confession there, it doesn't mean that we have to stand up and, you know, make a confession and confess our sins and all this. What it's talking about is we won't be ashamed to tell men our hope. We won't be ashamed anymore to speak Christ's word before men. Now you, you get this, a, a great many, many preachers, they'll tell you privately they believe the doctrine of election and predestination and they believe particular redemption that Christ only died for a particular number of people. They'll tell you that in private, but they won't preach it publicly. That means they don't believe it. That's what John was talking about. Whosoever confesseth. This is how you can discern the spirits. This is how you can tell the spirit that's of the Lord. Whoever, whosoever confesseth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. If he won't speak it out loud and he won't preach it out loud and he won't, he's embarrassed to get up and, and, and speak God's word before men and tell, just read the scriptures and say, this is God's word. He doesn't believe it. He doesn't believe it. You know, uh, you see in a man's face when a man's ashamed. That's where you see it. You see it in his face. If a man is, is ashamed, his face turns red and he blushes with shame. There, there's a reason the face turns red when, you, when you're ashamed of something. And that's what the Lord's saying right here. Those who actually look to Christ, who have truly been made by grace to look to Christ, they made one with Christ, and they're getting their life from Christ, they get all their light from Christ, and, and that light that's coming to you, when you are given light to believe on Christ, and your, it says their face was enlightened, your face is in light. When somebody gets good news and you, you have something to rejoice in, you see that on their face. And their face is enlightened. And that enlightened face is, man believeth unto righteousness. God makes you know in the court of your conscience. Your sins have been put away by Christ and you're forgiven and you're made the righteousness of God in Him. And the law and the accuser and nobody can ever lay anything to your charge again because Christ has made you righteous. And that lightens up your face. That brightens up your face. You have the life of Christ in you. His light. So now, you're not ashamed of Him anymore. You can't be ashamed when you get that news. You can't be ashamed when He made you to know that. And so you're not ashamed. You're willing to confess Him. And when you confess Him, also it means you won't be ashamed for confessing Him. You'll never be ashamed... God will not let you be put to shame for trusting Him. In other words, he won't, he won't betray that trust. You'll never be ashamed for trusting Him. They shall be ashamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. Someday, all men who are trusting in a false god that they've carved out in their imagination and perhaps they even carved him out in a statue or something, but everybody that believes in the false god of their imagination, they're going to be ashamed and confounded. But listen to this. But Israel, that's God's elect people, redeemed, regenerated, saved by the Lord, all His elect people, Jew and Gentile. Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation, and you shall not be ashamed nor confounded, world without end, forever and ever. You'll never be ashamed. You'll never be confounded. Now, brethren, that's the... That's the first way our Lord uses to show us, to teach us to come and look to Him, trust Him and believe on Him. Look at all the brethren in the past that did. Now here, then He tells, He uses Himself for the example. He says in verse 6, it's just Christ speaking now. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. Now, when you hear Christ saying this poor man you think well how could that be about Christ he is the son of God he's God the son he's the second person in the trinity equal with God that's true but when our Lord Jesus Christ became a man 
He came down and he, he took flesh like his brethren and he took the form of a servant. He willingly became a servant under the law of God to serve God as the one man, the head, who alone would, would, would represent all his people. He would be the righteousness for all his people and justify all his people from our sins. And when he humbled himself and took flesh and came under the law, he came and served God in perfect obedience even to the death of the cross. Go with me to Hebrews 5. And it was necessary that he suffer. He had to be the poor man. It was an absolute necessity. Let me show you why. Hebrews 5, look at verse 1. Every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men. And that's what Christ did. He came down and was made a man so he could be taken from men, from among men, for men. And here's the two reasons. In things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, and then as pertaining to men, verse 2, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. In our psalm, Christ is teaching us what he knows by experience as a man. And he's teaching you and I to trust him because he knows this as, from experience having walked right where we walk. Now watch this, verse 3. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that's called of God, as was Aaron. And so also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest. He didn't put himself in this position. But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he said also in another place, Thou art a priest, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now watch this part. Who in the days of his flesh, when he was as a man representing his people, it says, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. Hold your place there. As a man, he's serving God, working out a perfect, holy heart, Obedience. A perfect, holy heart obedience from a pure heart. He's working that out for His people to be our holiness. And He's justifying us from our sins, working out a perfect righteousness that He might be our righteousness. And therefore, He has to do that. He has to be entirely dependent upon God. Entirely dependent upon God. He could not Exercise his authority as God in this. He had to be entirely dependent upon God. And so when he, when he was suffering, made sins for us, made our curse, and then when he was justifying us from our sins, we see him praying and making supplications to God just like you and I do. Just like you and I pray. And utter dependence upon God. Supplicating God. Begging God to help us. That's exactly what our Redeemer did. In the Garden of Gethsemane, remember he said, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. He was experiencing the weakness of our flesh. My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. And he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. And then on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Now watch this. He goes back and talks about those past brethren, giving himself encouragement, just like he's doing for us, talking about those past brethren. He said, Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. They were not ashamed. But I am a worm. Christ said that. 
I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. In our psalm, he says of himself, this poor man cried unto God. He's saying this afflicted man, this emptied man, this sin-bearing man, this God-forsaken man, this man-forsaken man. But he said in Psalm 22, 10, I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble's near, for there's none to help. So that's what it's talking about here in Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5, 7, He cried with strong crying and supplications unto Him that was able to save Him from death. Verse 7, And was heard because He feared, because He reverenced God in perfect holy faith. Now, why did he have to do that? Why did he have to suffer that? Verse 8, though he were a son, though he's God, the son, yet learned he, that is, experienced he, obedience as a man by the things which he suffered. Verse 9, and being made perfect, having perfected obedience and wisdom and holiness and righteousness and redemption for His people, having perfected glorifying God to the highest, having perfected being perfectly consecrated to God, He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. God heard Him and raised Him from the grave to His right hand, and now Christ is the author of eternal salvation. That means... He's the one who made salvation, and He is the salvation He made. He's the author of eternal salvation, but only to them that cast all their care on Him. And you see the faithfulness in what Christ is teaching us here? Think about this statement now. Go back to Psalm 34 and look at that again. Verse 6, This poor man cried. You see in that? You see as the high priest. You see him being faithful to God and faithful to his people even unto the death of the cross. He, he depended on God. He cried unto God. That was necessary to make reconciliation for the sins of God's people and to glorify God. You see right there, you see his faithfulness as our high priest toward God and men. And then look at this. And the Lord heard him. We see his faithfulness as God who heard him and raised him. And then he says it saved him out of all his troubles. And then just in the overall fact that he's teaching us this in this psalm, we see his faithfulness to teach us that he is faithful, that he alone can make us unashamed and bring his redeemed to cast our care on him. We see his faithfulness in that. And then by showing us all these brethren in the past, we see his faithfulness in saving all our past brethren. Just in this one statement, brethren, you see faithfulness, 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 faithfulness. And so that's what he's showing us, how this, this gives you great reason to cast your care on him. Now, I, I may not finish. That was my first point. <laughs> but let's see. Let's go a little further. I won't, I won't hold you long. Now, here's the point of Christ's message, Psalm 34, 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Our God has many created angels. I don't know a lot about angels, but there are a lot of... The angels are created. He created them. He let some fall, and he's reserved them in chains of bondage, and they're going to be cast out into everlasting darkness. And the devil's using those angels. But don't make any mistake, the devil was an angel created. But he only can do what God permits him to do. He's serving God's purpose. He's the creator of evil, the devil. And when he, when he works evil, it's him that does it. And God only permits him to do what serves God's purpose in glorifying him and saving his people. That gives us great confidence right there because he can do nothing but what God permits him to do. But the rest of the angels are God's elect angels. And those angels are, are serving God for the purpose of protecting God's people. Hebrews 1.14 says, 
Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Angels are real. It's not like what Hollywood portrays it as or what the Catholic Church portrays it as. Angels are God's ministering spirits that are encamped all around God's people. They're probably a host of angels right here, right now. And you and I can't see them. But they're protecting God's people. That's what they, they can control things. They can touch things and move things and move you and move your heart and turn you this way and that way and the other way to protect you. They, otherwise, they wouldn't be able to protect us. But the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord's presence as talked about here is Christ Jesus, the Son of God. He's not a created angel. He's God. He's, the, he's called here the angel of God's presence. He's the angel of the covenant. He's the captain of our salvation. He's the leader and commander of his people. Christ is that angel that was with Moses and the children of Israel, leading them through the wilderness. Go, go to Exodus 23. I want you to see this. This shows us what Christ is doing right now for uh, his people because Moses and the children of Israel are a picture of, of uh, God's preacher and his people going through this world, through our life, in our lifetime. And this is what Christ is doing for us right now. Just what he did for Moses and the children of Israel. Exodus 23, 20. God said, God said, Behold, I sent an angel before thee to keep thee in the way. Isn't that some Christ is the way? And he is the angel who keeps us in the way. And to bring thee into the place which I have prepared, beware of him and obey his voice. How does he speak? How does he speak? How does Christ, the angel of God, speak? He's speaking right now. This is how he speaks, through the preaching of his word. And he speaks into, he goes forth before everybody, but it, he makes it effectual only in the hearts of his people. He says here, Obey his voice, provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. That means he will not let them go unchastised. He will not let them go without correction. For my name is in him. And you know that's Christ. God's name's in him. He says, but if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak. Now this is what Christ is teaching us in this psalm. To obey him. To look to him. Trust him. To lead us. And God says here, if you will indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I'll be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary to thine adversaries. For mine angels shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites, all those enemies. And he says there in the end, and I'll cut them off. If you trust him and look to him and obey him. You know what happened? They got to the land of Canaan. And you know what they did? They saw all those enemies, just like God said would be there, but they did not listen to the Lord. They did not obey the voice of his angel. They didn't trust Christ. In the New Testament, we know it's the angel of the Lord because it says they, I believe it says they frustrated Christ or they opposed Christ, some, something to that effect, but it's talking about that angel that, that led them. And so they wandered on in the wilderness until they died. Isaiah 63, 9 speaks of Christ, the same talking about with Moses, and it says, In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them and he bare them and he carried them all the days of old. That's Isaiah 63, 9. That's Christ, the angel of God's presence. And those that really fear him, by God's grace, given a heart reverence for him, they fear him and they obey him. We obey his voice through faith. We obey his voice first and foremost by casting all our care on him. John says this is his commandment. It's one commandment. That you believe on him whom he hath sent. And love one another. Love your brethren. And you can't have one without the other. Where he's given faith, he's given a new heart. And there'll be love there. The love of God will be there. So you, you, you're not saved by believing and loving. That's not how we're saved. We're saved by Christ. And the obedience of faith is you cast all your care on Him, trusting Him to be your righteousness. He's the righteousness of the law for you. He justified us from all our sins. He's our full redemption from the curse of the law. 
our redemption from this world, our redemption from these bodies. Christ is all to us. And He's the holiness within that makes us have a pure heart and be able to believe Him and trust Him. And He's the, he's the holiness who keeps us sanctified, the sanctifier who keeps us sanctified from this world and looking only to Him as our holiness. So we glory only in Him. And those that really do obey His voice and believe on Him, the angel of God's presence, Christ and all this heavenly host of angels that He has, following Him, obeying Him, doing what He will have them to do, Christ and that whole host of angels are constantly encamped round about His people, delivering us constantly, all the time. All the time. Zechariah 9.8 says, God says, I will encamp about mine house because of the army, because of him that passeth by, and because of him that returneth. And no oppressor shall pass through them any more, for now I have seen with mine eyes. The Targum. You ever heard of the Targum? It was, a, it was an Aramaic interpretation of the Hebrew Bible around 1st century A.D. And the Targum... On that verse in Zechariah, this is how the Targum said it. I like this. It says, I will cause my glorious Shekinah to dwell in the house of my sanctuary and the strength of the arm of my power shall be as a wall of fire round about it. <laughs> I pray God to give us hearts to really understand this and enter into this. Christ and that heavenly host of angels will protect and defend us like a giant wall of fire all around us. No oppressor shall pass through them anymore, God says. That means not the law. Christ fulfilled it and honored it. Not justice. Christ is fully satisfied justice. Not Satan. Christ has crushed his head. Not false prophets. Not governments of this world. Not wicked men and their heresies. None of that shall stop God's church from gathering together and worshiping Christ and following Christ and being kept by Christ from falling out of faith. No, nothing, nothing, no enemy, no oppressor is going to stop God's people from being together, worshiping Him, and passing right through this wilderness. Nothing. Because Christ and His angels are encamped about us. He says, for now I've seen with my eyes why, what, is, what did God see with his eyes that would make him protect his people so much? He's seen the finished work of Christ. <laughs> He's seen what Christ has accomplished for his people. And he won't let any harm come to them. He's encamped round about them that fear him and he delivers them. There's a lot of illustrations of this, but I want to show you one. 2 Kings 6. You know the one I'm going to. 2 Kings 6. This is my favorite illustration of it. Elisha and his servant, they're going to Dothan and they're camped out and they wake up the next morning and the servant comes out of the tent and he goes out there and he's trying to see if there's any live coals still left. He's trying to get them all and get a fire going and he's wanting to make a pot of coffee. And uh, he looked up and there is the enemy on horses all the way around them. And he scurried and run back to the tent. Look here at 2 Kings 6 and uh, verse, uh, verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? We're surrounded. And he answered, Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. <laughs> now I'm sitting here telling you just what this man told him. I've been sitting here telling you there's a host, Christ and a host of angels around us right now. You reckon that man felt like you kind of feel when I tell you that? He, yeah, all right. Well, watch this. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. The Lord was all around them. They had more with them 
than the people had. And Elisha prayed and said, blind these folks. And the Lord blinded them. And they sent them another direction. And they delivered them. Christ entered covenant to save all God's elect. Christ shed His blood for us and, and prepared an inheritance for us. And Christ has been given full power and authority as His, His reward of glory to protect us and bring us all to the Father. And God's faith, Christ is faithful to Him, to God. And He's not going to let one of His people perish. And so He's encamped around about us, brethren. He said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. And I give them eternal life. And no, they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. He won't allow it. Now, I'm going to finish it up. This is, this is the point. Now, it comes to this most important exhortation we'll ever hear. Now, listen. This is, his, this is where he's coming to. Verse 8. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. Now, this is important. We come here and we hear this gospel week in and week out. And most everybody here, from the littlest to the oldest, most everybody here knows something of the truth. We all know, you know, that God must regenerate and give life. You know that. You've heard that preached. You know that no man can come to Christ except the Father draw him. You've heard that preached over and over. You know repentance and faith are gifts of God. You know salvation from beginning to end is to the glory and praise of God. You, you've heard that. You know that. But he doesn't say there, blessed is the man that knows doctrine. That's not what he said. He says, blessed is the man that actually trusts in him. That actually trusts in him. Happy is the man who actually takes refuge in Christ. This is what he's teaching us. It's not enough to know God gives light to those that walk in his light. It's not enough to know that. You must walk in it. It's not enough to know he gives light to those that walk in his light. We must walk in His light. It's not enough to, to make the excuse, well, I know God's sovereign and He's got to give me light to make me want to pick this book up and read it. I can't use God's sovereign power and that, that necessity as an excuse. I need to pick the book up and read it. <laughs> Myself. That's true of me. That's true of you. I was talking to a man about seeking and calling and supporting a a preacher. And he said, well, I know God's sovereign. If he's got a man that he's going to send, he's chosen before the world was made and he's got him picked out and he's going to send him when the time is right and he's going to make a way and everything's going to be provided for him. I said, you're exactly right. I said, and you're going to have to pick the phone up and call him and schedule an appointment and then ask him to come be your pastor and then show up every week and hear the gospel preach and reach way down in your bank account and support him. Because what he was saying to me was an excuse. It wasn't the truth, to honor the truth. It was using God's sovereignty as an excuse for being lazy. Is what it was. And our Lord's teaching us here, brethren, it's not enough to know a system of doctrine or enjoy hearing sermons or admire the preacher's ability to point out Old Testament pictures of Christ and all that. I myself must actually cast my care on Christ. I myself must commit to Christ and His work of spreading the gospel. I must commit to His people. I must sacrifice to help them and support the gospel being preached. I must not be ashamed myself to confess Christ before men. Blessed is the man who actually trusts Him. Who trusts Him. So let me end with this. To you who have not yet confessed Christ, our Lord says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. The happy man is the man who actually puts all his trust in the Lord. So taste, actually taste. If you come in, and poor little Chloe, you know they won't let her eat anything. She can't eat anything. She wants to eat. I guarantee you, if you set, if you set this bread before her, she's going to taste and see. And that's what he's saying. It won't do you any good if this bread is before you and you see the bread and you admire the bread and you talk about the bread and you can tell what the bread looks like and how it's made and what it looks and how the plate is set on and all that, you got to eat the bread. you got to eat Christ. you got to partake of His flesh and 
His blood. You got to live upon Him. And I must not be ashamed to do so. No more, nobody's more worthy to be trusted than Christ. So trust Him. And for you now who've just been called to cast your care on Christ. Peter said, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby, if so be you've tasted the Lord is gracious. Desire it. That doesn't mean just be hungry for it. That means live upon it. That means partake of Him, drink it up, and ask for seconds. And keep doing it. And for us who have been in the faith a little while, same thing. Don't ever lose your desire to partake of Christ and continue partaking of Christ just like a newborn baby. Longing for that pure word and partaking of the Lord Himself. Don't ever think it's all right just to hear. and Don't, don't always be truly actually Casting your care on Him. That's His point in this whole thing. Amen.